Good afternoon. My name is Galen Williams. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Whisper Energy. We are an ultra low power sensor platform for reducing energy in commercial buildings. And that is an example of our customer on the right. That is a commercial building, 65,000 square feet. We're targeting the small and mid-sized commercial building market. There's almost 700,000 of them across the United States. And we define them as having less than 110,000 square feet. Just to give you perspective, this facility or this particular building is 91,000 square feet. I talked to the uh, facilities manager. I chased him down this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> That's what founders do. So here's the problem, and some of you already know this. Most of the buildings in America, every, it's well known within the industry that they waste 30% of all energy that's consumed. There's 6 million across the United States. So the low-hanging fruit to reach our carbon, foot, our carbon goals is to reduce the energy waste in commercial buildings. That's an easy, easy thing to do if we approach it right. In some cases, it's being uh, mandated by the local municipalities, New York, Seattle, California. So we'd like to call this carbon pressure. I call it carbon pressure. The owners of these buildings, the tenants of these buildings are experiencing carbon pressure to quickly reduce their carbon footprint, reduce greenhouse gases, in short, they become more energy efficient. However, small and mid-sized buildings, less than 15% of them have any type of building automation. They're analog, non-digital. They have no way of saving, let alone even knowing what they're wasting or what they're using in the building. So our solution is to provide our ultra low power sensors. Our sensors help reduce energy consumption by 30% or more. They're wireless, so they don't require any cabling or wiring. You can literally put an adhesive on the back, stick them on the wall, stick them on the doors. They use machine learning, so they get intelligent over, more time, over time. And they're battery free. That is huge for a facilities manager because that's one less thing to do on their maintenance schedule is change out batteries for a 100,000 square foot building. But wait, there's more. <laughs> they stack like Legos. They're very small footprint. They can fit probably in the half of the, the palm of my hand. They stack up like Legos. This is a uh, prototype. Uh, obviously, they'll look a little bit better uh, once we get to the to market. But this was uh, underwritten by the ARPA-E, Department of Energy, for, with a $2 million grant. Uh, we have two patent applications that are pending. Our SOM. Our SOM is large. I can justify this if you think it's too large. This is California only. $2 billion. This is our obtainable market just in California. And we do this via the energy efficiency as a service model. Most of our customers cannot afford to make the changes, upgrade to equipment in order to get these energy efficiencies. So we take that problem off the table, we finance it, we partner with a contractor to implement it and maintain it, everyone's happy. Typical, con typical contract period is five years, so this is a literally a sticky customer relationship. Get them once, you've got them for five years or more. We do have competitors, but I don't wanna talk about them. If you wanna ask about them in the q and I'll do it. <laughs> it's only three minutes, people. Progress to date. Uh, we have two letters of support. I've completed uh, two i -Corps classes, uh, 140 plus uh, customer discovery uh, conversations and interviews. Uh, we're in, in USC's uh, Viterbi School of Engineering Incubator. That's how I got here. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. Completed uh, a venture studio, Deep Tech Venture Studio at CU Boulder, as well as two other Deep Tech accelerators, one at CU Boulder, the other one at MIT, uh, the Engines Hard Tech Accelerator. The team. My co-founder is Dr. Gregor Henza. He's a uh, professor at CU Boulder. He's the chair of the engineering department. He's also a, a fellow at NREL, which is also on our cap table, uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab. And he and I met about a year ago through a Venture Studio program matched up with this technology. The team that actually invented this technology, Whisper uh, Sensors, collectively have over 70 patents, just in uh, sensors, sensor communications, et cetera. The rest of the team, 30 years of energy management and consulting experience, and we have, of course, two MBAs. We have startup experience, uh, business development experience, and financial services. Collectively, we're well suited to address this problem. Our ask, $750,000. We don't need it all at once from you. 350 will do. Year <laughs> one, post-funding, year one, we expect uh, revenues of about $1 million. I'm sorry, I have to cut you off here for time. <laughs> but hopefully someone will ask about the uh, stuff on the slide right now. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'd like to ask about the competitor slide. Of course. Uh, but <laughs> I'm uh, mostly interested in the opportunities to partner because there's a lot of companies that are trying to, to um, 
create like operating systems for buildings and things like that. So, so how much of that is of opportunities to partner? How much are direct competitors to you? So the competitors, I was being a little flip, but it's true. It's a big market, first of all. So what we do have in common, the competitors that you see on this slide, we're all offering energy efficiency as a service. That's what we have in common. We all lead with a different technology. Some are leading with heat pumps. Some are leading with uh, smart metering, et cetera. So that's the entry point to get into the market. And then the financing comes secondly, because you just want to get the customers on board. To your question about partnering, you have to partner, if only for the... Uh, Yes, if you go into a facility 100,000 square feet, no one has all the expertise. Some have HVAC expertise, sensors like us, um, electrical. There's a lot of leaks that we're finding. Um, the energy is being wasted because there's just gas leaks, et cetera. So there's a lot of uh, areas to partner. Uh, and ultimately, I think that's our exit strategy is initially we have a joint venture with a building automation firm. We have a good relationship. We partner with each other on a few projects. In three or four years, we get a, an acquisition offer. That's the dream. Uh, so yes. Piggybacking on that, uh, there are a number of existing uh, building management software platforms, Cisco Meraki, Johnson Controls has got one, a few others. Do you have one targeted initially as your beachhead for system compatibility? Uh, I have a short list, yes. Um, the companies that you mentioned, uh, that's the enterprise market. That's another thing I failed to mention, uh, Ken, with the uh, competitors. They're all focused on that top 3% of the marketplace. So complexes like this, universities, uh, AT&T, for example, you sell once, you're in 200 different stores. Our target market, uh, I literally talked to someone that's done three or 400 assessments in Southern California, hasn't run across a building automation system. They just don't exist. And, there's, and we're deliberately targeting this market because, uh, yeah, we can't compete with the big guys. We want to partner with them eventually. But uh, right now, we just don't run across that at all. But we have a few on the list that we, I think we could partner with for a complete solution. How much of it is um, an education component to your end market? If you're gonna partner with like contractors or other building maintenance people, they actually have to understand what this is in order to relay that to their end and be able to talk intelligently enough about it to then sell it for you as a, to a certain extent. So can you talk a little bit about sure. the education piece? Sure, there's definitely an education component. I'm, I'm a little reluctant to outsource the sales to the third party. Uh, just, I just bring them in as a vendor, you know, and we'll manage that relationship. I'll just kind of show you for graphical interface. So I prefer to manage the, the, the contractor uh, relationship. So it, there is an education component to it. Um, our competitors, the enterprise market, 12 to 15 month sales cycles, not uncommon. Uh, in our business, our financial model, we've estimated a six month sales cycle. And a lot of that is just talking to the facilities manager. They have lots of influence, but they don't necessarily have P&L. So then you have to talk to the general manager, like, yo, you're going to save me money? Sure, I'll save money. But they may be a tenant, so now you got to talk to the building owner. At least two of them have no idea what this business model is like. They've heard of it. There's incentives and government dollars available to them. They're too busy working. So there is an educational component, but we factor that in into the sales cycle. So for the projects yes. that you guys are implementing, what's the average return on this investment in terms of timeline? Is it building owners see their money back in five, oh, yeah. 10 good, years, yeah. good, seven years? Good question, like, good question. So the data that we've looked at, there's a lot of it. Um, two or three years, uh, that's kind of the sweet spot. Um, one for them just being amenable to it. But for large implementations, if you're changing out a, a cooler, a new energy efficient cooler, you know, seven, eight hundred thousand or a chiller, you know, could be a quarter of a million dollars. Then that that timeline is going to be extended. Um, our competitors, they have 10 and 15 year contracts. Uh, I don't anticipate that with our market. I think five years will be sufficient, but the ROI should be about two or three years. So we can structure it like a mortgage. You know, they pay a, their share all up front and we get the back end or we or we split the savings, you know, month to month annually. Uh, there's a lot of ways to slice and dice it. But I, I think about a two or three year ROI is appropriate uh with your funding that you're trying to raise what are you what milestones are you hoping to accomplish milestones yes let me show you so first six months we're going to have a couple of partnerships um, it all starts with an assessment so we've identified an organization in fact we have two consulting verbal consulting agreements subsequent to some funding so i can do it because i'm doing everything else um, we need a few more people for it they do the assessments 
So we want to formalize that where we have a partnership, you're the assessor. Once you do the assessment, you turn it over to us or we get it from the customer and then we can start to work on the financing component. Um, that first year, six clients, that million in revenue, that's the big one. Uh, once, we, once we show one or two clients, that just opens up a whole nother, uh, not only just funding, but potential for partnerships. I can talk to some of the enterprise competitors for partnerships without uh, getting eaten alive from going into the room because you know, we're, we're demonstrating some traction. So I think that's the big one, just getting customers revenue. Um, one customer we get on the DOE's website as a you know, partner, vendor, et cetera. So that opens up a lot of doors. And then, yeah, get profitable in the next, the subsequent 36 or 24 months. You have a calculator for how many units per square foot or how many, how to estimate how many units you need per building. And then what's your per unit costs per unit costs. Thanks for that question. Thanks. So our competitors, the JLLs, Johnson controls, et cetera, the average cost of the customer is 250 to 750 per square feet. Um, our cost is six cents per square foot at scale. Uh, our financial model, I think we, with a little sensitivity analysis, a dollar to dollar 25 per. Um, we have lots of wiggle room. Obviously, it's going to be more expensive once we start adding some bells and whistles, APIs, et cetera. But that was part of the DOE uh, constraints was to make it economical so there would be uptake. So that's what they spent the $2 million on. We use materials that are just off the shelf, so no special manufacturing. Our pieces is just how it's, how it's put together. So yeah, six cents per square foot. Um, yeah, we're anticipating 70% gross margins plus. I'm curious if you've had any contact to the U.S. Green Building Council, um, because I know they, they work uh, on arranging pilots and stuff with technologies perhaps similar to this. Thank you. They're on the list. I just haven't called them yet. <laughs> they're, they're actually <laughs> the list pretty, is getting long. They're pretty active here in Los Angeles uh, with heard. the Net Zero Accelerator, which is a really, really good program. Okay. Uh, so I'll look into it. Thank you. Thank you. With regards to your go-to-market strategy, are you focusing on California and Colorado first, given that's the market size you've presented, or do you have other strategic approaches? Let's see if I have that slide. No, I got to see what deck I sent you guys. Okay, we don't have that. So California primarily, because we're here. Um, Colorado is where I obviously had spent some time. Um, at a Attitude-wise, they're similar markets. Obviously, this market here is much larger, and my co-founder's there, so you know, gotta let Colorado have a chance to make some money from us. Um, but the West Coast, there's really about 10 states. 10 states. We've identified 41,000 um, commercial buildings. When you really narrow it down, 700,000 that I talked about, 15% don't have that have building automation. When it gets down to it, we've identified 41,000 uh, buildings, and they're in 10 states. 20,000 of them rather in 10 states, most on the West Coast, uh, Colorado, one or two in the Midwest. Uh, that's, if we get significant penetration there, I'm sure we'll have lots of acquisition calls before we even have to branch outside of that, but start on the West Coast. Just piggybacking on that, have you looked into the political landscape of like the regulations people are putting on buildings in different states, like New York, for example, local law 97. Oh yeah. I'm sure it's creating pressure for more customers to come to your door. Um, have you been tracking that across all states and has that influenced your decision for California and Colorado or is it just market size? In at a high level, at a macro level, it has because you want to go to a market where you don't necessarily have to explain that climate change is real and it's OK to save energy. I mean, in some places, that's that's a hostile conversation. It literally is. So in Colorado, it is not. In California, it's definitely not. Um, New Yorkers are upset about it. Um, because if you're a building owner, what is, I think it's 25,000 square feet. If those of you don't know it, you know, 25,000 square feet, uh, you have to be energy efficient within a year or two by X percent. And so it's a huge retrofit cost. Uh, I, I kind of wish we were in New York for that. <laughs> I think it's going to be a land grab if they don't stop it with a lawsuit, but yes, I'm, I am, I am watching it, but California, uh, and just the amount of buildings and our segment that we've identified, uh, it, it's kind of a land grab a little bit education to your question earlier, we got to educate them a little bit, say this is what you can do, this model, and it's a little bit of a land grab. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs>